Pink Floyd, and I kind of love that in the opening treatment, uh, John kind of posed it as a question saying, as we focus on the metaphysical music, a message of Pink Floyd, and by the way, John did a masterful meditation earlier today, yeah? If you were here for that, <coughs> and a great opening treatment. So I love that opening song, and uh, we had to do that one because one of Pink Floyd's, uh, bi their biggest hit, actually. But I'm not going to talk about money today, at least until we get to the offering. But um, I want to focus on the, the lyrics of a song that came, just a little bit of history about the band. Most people know about Pink Floyd from Dark Side of the Moon on and don't realize that they had seven albums before Dark Side of the Moon. They started in 1965, and one of those albums was called Metal, and one side of the album was one complete song called Echoes. These are the, and most of it is all instrumental, and there's a very short area about in the middle that's uh, this lyrics, and these are the lyrics to that song. Uh-oh. There we go. And no one called us to the land. And by the way, it starts out with this really melodic, uh, echoey sounds. And so it's very, very um, mystical. And, and no one called us to the land. And no one knows the wheres or whys. Something stirs and something tries, starts to climb toward the light. Do you get the sense of it's about evolution, right? Um, that from the first single-celled uh, organism to us, we continue to climb toward the light, yes? And by the way, I want you to, as I go through the song, see if you can pick out what my favorite lyric is in the song, okay? Strangers passing in the street, by chance two separate glances meet, and I am you and what I see is me. Almost every day you fall upon my waking eyes, inviting and inciting me to rise. And through the window in the wall come streaming in on sunlight wings a million bright ambassadors of morning. Isn't that beautiful? And so it sounds like he's calling to the sun, or is he calling to spirit, or are those two the same, right? And no one sings me lullabies, and no one makes me close my eyes. So I throw the windows wide and call to you, Across the sky. So, what's my favorite lyric? Right okay, see, I, I emphasized that one just to throw you off. <laughs> Very good. That last line, and I am you, and what I see is me. Isn't that a m just m one of the most poetic ways of expressing, I think, the most important concept of our teaching, which is that we are all one, right? I am you. And, all I, and what I see is me. So I want to talk about oneness a little bit. And what I find, the further and further I go into my spiritual practice, as I go down this spiritual journey, I find that all of my spiritual practices are starting to happen kind of automatically, kind of naturally. There are still times when I use the practice, but there are times when I don't have to, when it just happens instantaneously. Anyone else have that experience? Yeah? So an example of this is, is my daughter, who is in the back, my stepdaughter. We went on a road trip up to see um, a band that we both like called Cage the Elephant. A anyone here of Cage the Elephant? Couple, all right. Very hip, very hip. So she turns me on to this, all this great new music, because as you know, if you haven't guessed, I'm a classic rock freak, right? But um <coughs> so the, the day that we were scheduled to leave, uh, it turned out we had to... to um, put down or send off our, our collie, Magic, who had been with us for 12 years. Beautiful dog, most gentle, loving soul you'll ever meet. And so we're sitting at this concert, and um, I'm feeling the sadness about that. And one of my practices is to embrace everything, to embrace any, situ any and all situations, to embrace all of my feelings. And so in this moment, I didn't have to do the practice. I... I felt the sadness. I felt that even drop into a bit of depression. I felt my energy just, just sinking. And instantly I embraced that feeling. I embraced the sadness. I embraced the depression. And it just flung me into an experience of oneness, an experience of pure bliss. And this happens more and more where, I, there, again, there are times when I still need to do the practice. And, but 
the good news is that the more we practice, the more automatic it becomes, right? So another practice that, that I, uh, is becoming more and more natural is detachment, not at being attached to any kind of outcome. Um, a couple weeks ago, Dr. Susan was talking about uh, David uh, Hawkins and his work where he measures the, the vibration of people, of things, of emotions, of places. And, the hi and what she said is the highest, the feeling that has the highest vibration is the feeling of peace. And what I've, I find is the more I give up attachment to, uh, to any kind of outcome or any kind of situation, the more at peace I am. And what I have found is the more at peace I am, the more power I have to create what I want. It's this interesting dichotomy. Is it's almost like the less I want it or I'm attached to it, the easier it can manifest. Does that make sense? So more powerful I find than all of the, um, all the practices, all the techniques for we have for manifesting what we want is simply letting go of our attachment to it happening. Because when that happens, then I don't even have to do an involved metaphysical technique. All I have to do is think, oh, that would be fun. And it, then my simple desire. It's like, rather than having part of my energy available to create it, because if I'm attached to something, there's some fear that it won't happen, and therefore my energy is going in that direction. Now I have all my energy available to create it because I'm at peace. The more peace I have, the more power I have. Make sense? So another element of my spiritual practice is, which goes right along with, um, with non-attachment, is non-judgment. Is not judging situations, not judging people. This is not new thought, by the way. This goes back to the Buddha. This was the, the hallmark of, of Buddhism, right? Is, is non-attachment and non-judgment. And so there are still times when I judge, many times. And my practice is, well, I'll give you an example. I was actually sitting uh, right back around where my daughter is in the second to the last row back there uh, about, I don't know, a month and a half ago. And um, I was in this really peaceful place. And someone walked down the aisle, and I had this judge. It wasn't like a really harsh judgment, but it was not a, a thought that was affirming the truth of that individual. And I had this judgment. Now, my practice is, when I, that happens, is to ask myself, okay, this thing that I'm judging in someone else, how does that exist in me? And if I'm telling the truth, and I usually do, there's never anything that I could see in someone else that I can't find in myself, right? In fact, if I'm judging someone else, it's always a projection of something in me anyway. And so in that instant, again, without trying to do the practice, I just instantly, and I don't even remember what the judgment was. Uh, let's see if I can pick out who it was I was judging. <laughs> uh, anyone else ever do that, by the way? Anyone judge anyone? Okay, there's four or five of us. <laughs> anyone, any time in your life, ever uh, judge anyone <laughs> in an unkind way? And... Um, no, it was something very mundane and, and, and inconsequential. But I just instantly, without having to do the practice, I instantly felt myself resonate with that person and recognize in that moment that there is no difference between the two of us and again went into a state of bliss and oneness. So the reason I point this out, I just want to emphasize again, that wherever we are on our spiritual journey, our spiritual path, our practice, that whether it's a new thing for you to be consciously, I mean, we're on a spiritual journey all of our lives, but if it's consciously unfolding for you, if it's a new thing, the spiritual practice is what it's about. I've been meditating for 40 years now almost, and... Um, and the more I do this, the more automatic it becomes. So keep doing your spiritual practice. And the most important thing about it, by the way, is not only to not judge other people, it's to not judge ourselves. So even when you are judging someone, then give up judgment about yourself judging someone, <laughs> right? Because that's where it starts, is creating this sense of peace and freedom 
which comes from accepting ourselves, loving ourselves just the way we are in each and every moment. Let's take a deep breath into loving ourselves just the way we are. Doesn't that feel good? Doesn't that make life a whole lot easier? You know, regardless of what my challenge is in my life, regardless of, of what mistake I just made, is to love myself no matter what. I think that's the most important thing to be emphasized in our teaching or any teaching. <coughs> so um, I meant to put this slide up earlier, but uh, this is the way Fitchnot uh, Han says it. To love our enemy is impossible. The moment we understand our enemy, we feel compassion towards him or her, and he or she is no longer our enemy. Right? We are one. We are one. We are one. And so I want to move to another song. And it's interesting because when I thought about these two songs, they're kind of very different messages in a way, but I realized in, in preparing the talk that they actually are extremely related as well. Wish You Were Here, and we're going to hear this song in a few moments. Um, so uh, Wish You Were Here. And by the way, both Dark Side and the Moon of the moon and and the album wish you were here which followed dark side of the moon were both um the themes were about sid barrett who was the one of the original members of the band who actually was the leader of the band who um after a couple years with the band and probably doing too many hallucinogens um started having some uh mental health problems and left the band and was actually institutionalized for a while. So Dark Side of the Moon, when it talks about uh, the lunatic is in your head, and um, one of my favorite lyrics in uh, uh, Eclipse, no, no, Brain Damage, I think, is when the band you're in starts playing different tunes, different tunes, I'll see you on the Dark Side of the Moon. Um, and Wish You Were Here is, a, is also about Sid Barrett, and part of the message is, is uh, Roger Waters wrote this song, is him singing to Sid Barrett, his friend, saying, I wish you were here, okay? But it also has a, a much more transcendent message that speaks to all of us, I believe. So you, so, so you think you can tell, heaven from hell, blue skies from pain. Can you tell a green feel, field from a cold steel rail, a smile from a veil, do you think you can tell? Do you know the truth? Can you see the truth of it all through the veil? Did they get you to trade your heroes for ghosts, hot ashes for trees, hot air for a cool breeze? breeze. By the way, let's play once again what Patrick's favorite lyric is, okay? <coughs> Cold comfort for change. By the way, hot air for a cool breeze. Environmental message there, right? Cold comfort for change. Did you exchange a walk-on part in the war for a lead role in a cage? How I wish, how I wish you were here. We're just two lost souls swimming in a fishbowl year after year, running over the same old ground. What have we found? The same old fears. Wish you were here. What's my favorite lyric in that song? Any guesses? Good one. Two lost souls swimming in a fishbowl. Good. What did you say? A walk on part in the war for a lead role in the cage. What does that mean? Anyone want to guess? What does that mean to you? Because it's a lyric. It's art. It could. There's no wrong answer, right? Pardon me. A lead role in a cage would be a king locked in a room. Okay. Very interesting. A lead role in a cage would be a king locked in a room. Yeah. What does that mean? Because that's the same meaning. I, <laughs> what you just said has the same meaning in my head. Anyone else? Prisoners of war. Prisoners of war, okay. Coming into this manifestation. Coming into this manifestation. Oh, yeah, very good. And I think all these answers, yes. Okay, good. And I think all of these, rela these re answers relate to, to what, how I see it, too. For me, it's a walk. Uh, did, did you exchange a walk in part in the war for a lead role in a cage? The war in this, in this point, to me, is not something uh, negative. Walk on part in the war is, is the war for truth. It's the war against conformity, okay? 
And a lead role in a cage would be, hey, maybe you en ended up with a corporate position, right? And you didn't follow your dream, something like that. Or maybe it's even, you know, a lead, uh, a, a walk on part in the, in, in the war is, um, is a commitment to, to truth. You know, a, again, and a lead role in a cage could be conformity. Does that make sense? So what this inspires in me, what this inspires in me this time, I, I have different messages from the song when I, when I hear it over the years, but um, how important the emphasis is on our individual life purpose, our sacred individualized purpose, the reason that we have come here to, to live and to be, what is unfolding for us as... Um, as Rumi said it, and so many different philosophers have said this in so many ways, let yourself be drawn by the stronger pull of that which you love. There's something in our hearts that we have come here to share that is the most meaningful and the most important thing. We're going to do a meditation. We're switching it up by today. If you didn't, not uh, if you didn't notice, we're doing the meditation a little later in the, in the talk instead of the beginning. So... Um, let yourself be drawn by the stronger pull of that which you truly love. So in the med meditation, I'm going to ask you to really connect with what in you is that sacred purpose. Um, when I <coughs> do my Live Your Passion workshops, one of the questions that I ask that is the clarifier for most people, 98% of the people, when they answer this question, like a light goes on. Okay, So the question is, what did you not get what did you not get enough of as a child? What's the most important quality or guidance you did not get enough of as a child? And once you answer that question then, how does it feel when you create that experience for someone else? And that's when the light goes on for what most people. That's when we realize, oh, what I didn't get enough of, when I create that experience for someone else, that's when I am in my passion. That's when I am in my greatest truth. That's when I am in my greatest power. And I believe that every one of us has come here to manifest that in whatever way. It could be in a large way. It could be in a small way. So I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. So um, another great teacher, one of our favorites on Wednesday night, this guy shows, always shows up. If you haven't been here on a Wednesday night, here's some <laughs> chuckles already. Uh, Swami Harbula Nanda <laughs> says... That which fulfills our greatest achievement, <coughs> trying to feel, I'm sorry, that which fulfills our greatest purpose is our greatest achievement. I can't say it, I can only write it. Trying to fill that purpose challenges us to face our strongest blocks and if successful, will uncover our greatest demons. It will also bring us the greatest joy and the most magic we can possibly imagine. How I define life purpose, by the way, is what we love to do that makes the world a better place or contributes to the lives of others. And what I find as a, a life coach, who's I've coached hundreds of people now to identify, to touch their purpose a at a deeper level, and to and to manifest that in whatever is way in whatever way is appropriate for them. I find that when people are moving toward that, toward any goal, but especially that most sacred goal, that most sacred vision. What happens is people's doubts and fears come up because at the, at the heart of every doubt and fear is one question and one question only, and that is, am I worthy of that degree of magnificence to live my passion, to live out my sacred purpose in this world? And of course, the answer is yes. Yes? So, um, yeah. Um, Dr. Jim was talking about a month ago about uh, quoting um, Guy Hen uh, Gay Hendricks, who says that, you know, we sometimes have an upper, an upper limit problem, right, where we get, we get to a certain place and then we have a harder time getting above that. And again, I find that when he was said that, it instantly occurred to me that I don't think I have that anymore. And I asked myself why. And it's because I, g I have given up attachment to any kind of outcome of any 
of anything. My, my, my entire, my most important practice is to live life from a place of joy right here and right now. And as a result, it doesn't matter what happens in the future. So there's no fear, there's no doubt, there's nothing to restrain me in that way because I'm free to, to stretch because if I'm living in, the, in, in joy and freedom right now, what else matters, right? And all of the great spiritual teachers have said the same thing. And what occurred to me, the relationship between the two songs then, is that what I find in coaching people is that in order to, to get to the place where we are ful fulfilling our sacred mission at the highest level, what is required and what ultimately happens is we go deeper and deeper into the truth of, of who we are. We, through taking our steps to moving in that direction, we find that we are not what all of the old tapes tell us that we are, that we are not worthy of our own magnificence, right? And so it comes back to that oneness. It comes back to that spiritual connection. It's what it's all about, is realizing the truth of who we are. That's what we come to this center to be reminded of, to remind each other of, yeah? So we're going to do this next song, and um, then we're going to go right into meditation after that. So this is going to be, this is a rare opportunity. This is uh, the great Andy Howe on guitar and on, with, on vocals, the amazing <laughs> Natalie Azarad. Give him a big hand. <laughs> I've been waiting a long time for this. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Check, check. We have to start all over Check, now. check. Oh, 
could change And did you exchange A walk on part in the war For a lead role in a Was that fun or what? Give them some more love, please. <clears throat> Isn't she amazing? I found her. Natalie is in um, the, the Pink Floyd cover band called Which One is Pink? And they're doing a, a gig in Santa Barbara next week and also a free concert in Woodland Hills. We're going to go on Father's Day <laughs> um, in uh, Woodland Hills. A uh, concert in the park, yeah. So... Um, I just want to, oh, let's do the uh, meditation. That's what I said we'd do. I almost <laughs> forgot. I was so uh, mesmerized by Andy's guitar playing. <laughs> hey, wasn't that great? Did you know Andy could play guitar like that? <laughs> Multi-talented, amazing musician. All right. Let's take a nice deep breath. Let out a big heartful sigh. Ah, one more time and let it all go this time. Uh, I want you to just think back. Oh, just continue to breathe deeply, by the way, and just with each deep breath, feel yourself becoming more and more relaxed and in tune, at ease, at peace, in your own understanding of yourself as truth, as power, as infinite, unconditional love. I'd like, like you to think back to a moment in your life when you felt that you were either working or living or playing at a very, very high level of your potential. And I'll just throw out some synonymous phrases and see which one inspires the most empowering memory for you. Perhaps it was a time when you were performing some task or some service and it felt like spirit was flowing through you effortlessly, unencumbered. Or perhaps it was a time when you would say that creativity was flowing through you effortlessly. Perhaps you would have called it a time when you felt like this is it. This is what I'm here to do. This is what I love to do that makes this world a better place or contributes to the lives of others. Or perhaps it was something much more inward, just a moment, a quiet moment of peace, a moment of love that you shared with another individual.
moment of understanding yourself as spirit, as one with all. Once you identify this memory, imagine that you are feeling it as though it were occurring right now. Feel the energy in your body as though it were happening now. Feel all the emotional sensations accompanied with this memory. As though it were happening right now, you're feeling it in your body here in this seat. Take a deep breath, fully integrate the entire experience in the now. And just touch that inner sacred purpose that you have come here to share. And now imagine that you are living yourself, your, this purpose, this sacred purpose, sometime in the future, at the highest level you can imagine. And perhaps it is accomplishing something you've wanted to do for a long time. Or perhaps it's just accomplishing some piece of that. Or perhaps it is simply contributing in a meaningful way to one person's life. What is the greatest thing that you could accomplish between now and the end of your life that, would, that will have given your life the meaning you want it to have? Imagine yourself doing that at the highest level you can imagine. And if you're not real visual, you don't have to see it. Just feel what it would be like. And then imagine that or actually feel the energy of this completed vision as though it were happening now. Feel, see it as clearly as you can. Feel the feelings associated with your highest potential being fulfilled. Feel the energy in your body as though it were happening right now. And just revel in this energy for a few moments. Feel your sacred purpose infused into your energy body, connecting with the power and the sacred purpose of every individual in this room, radiating out into the world, surrounding the planet, having a positive effect in this moment. And just breathe deep into this truth, this magnificence of who you really are. As we listen to Andy's beautiful music.
Is that good for you? <clears throat> good for me, too. <clears throat> so I thought about um, <clears throat> how I was going to conclude today, and I thought, well, what would be a, a heartwarming story to share with you, to kind of integrate what we've come here to talk about today? And what instantly popped into my mind was my mother. And before I share a little story about her, I just want to also honor both of my stepdaughters who are here today. Because talking about live your passion, one is in, in finishing up school to be a teacher, the other is in art school in Baltimore back for the summer. Um, and both of them knew from a very young age what they wanted to do, and they were following, following that passion. And so I honor both of them, Allison and, and uh, Carmen Elizabeth. So let's give them a big hand. <coughs> they don't usually come to the service. <coughs> and so, um, so my mother was a, uh, some of you kn knew her. She come, came to the services with me once in a while. She was 92 when she passed uh, about a year and a half ago. And, you know, all of her life, her, her, her passion was tennis. And she, she was um, a tennis pro in her early days. She was 12th in the country at one time. And in her 80s, she was ranked number one in the 80 and over and 80, <laughs> 80, the 85. She actually, uh, about a year and a half before she, she passed, she played in um, the National Clay Court Championship at the LA Tennis Club for 90 and over, <laughs> if you can believe that. She came in third place, right? <laughs> This woman was such a powerful lady, and she was so non-assuming. She would never tell you about her greatness, right? And at her memorial, people stood up, and, and even I was amazed at <laughs> some of the things she did that I didn't know about. And, um, and so she, she lived her passion all of her life. She pretty much was e either playing tennis or watching tennis or thinking or talking about tennis most of her life. And... Um, and uh, yeah, she's just an amazing woman. And, and, and at her memorial, actually, someone said, so interesting, they said, it was a student, of, a tennis student of hers, and she got up and she said, you know, Ellie used to always tell me, you know, don't worry about winning the match, don't worry about the outcome, <laughs> right? Don't be attached to the outcome, just have fun. Be in the moment playing. And I thought, did she teach that too? I thought that was my <laughs> idea. <laughs> Gosh, I thought it was an original thought. And, um, <laughs> and so <coughs> she, um, just to share with you, I just got a, a letter this last week. She is being inducted into the Tennis Hall of Fame this coming September. Cool. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, I won't be, she won't be there in physical form. She'll be there in spirit to accept the award. I'll be there in physical form to accept the award for her. And um, so whether you win an award or not, what I really want to encourage you to do is to touch each and every day your sacred purpose, what you have come here to do. And again, it's not important how you do it. If it's a big thing, it's a little thing. If it touches one individual, because we never even know how far and wide the ripples go for the gifts that we offer and share pe with people in our daily lives. So Natalie's going to come up in, in, in a moment and blow us away with this song called Great Gig in the Sky by Pink Floyd. And uh, this, one, uh, this is the song that she st sings on stage with them. And it's about, well, you can decide for yourself what it's about, but uh, you know, my mom is playing in that great tennis gig in the sky now. So I want you to connect with What's the great gig in the sky for you? What is your connection with spirit? And allow these vocals, there's no lyrics in this song, it's just these amazing vocals. Allow them to just take you and lift your spirit up into that sacred place, touching that sacred purpose, that sacred uniqueness that you have. I want to remind you that you are an infinite, powerful, magnificent being. You have come here to be that and to express it. And now is the time to let go of all the untruths that we have accepted that keep us from being in that truth. I want you to make today, next week is Father's Day, I want you to make today and every day me sacred me day. <laughs> 
okay? I want for the rest of this day, if you're willing, and why wouldn't you be, to, to treat yourself as the most important person in the entire world. Because you are. Because you represent us all. Because we are one. Thank you. <coughs> Natalie Azarad, check this out.
<laughs> Thank you. Natalie Azarad. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you, Patrick.